Okay, good morning. Welcome everyone to our first fall meeting of the Online Peace Science Colloquium. I'm Chelsea Estancona and I am an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina. I'm one of the current co-organizers of this colloquium uh, alongside Brad Smith, who is an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. Uh, so the Online Peace Science Colloquium has been uh, in existence. We've been doing this uh, regularly since 2015. This started as an addendum to the annual meeting of the Peace Science Society, uh, which was meant to sort of extend and celebrate the excellent research that is happening both before and after the annual PSS meeting. And in this case, we are immediately before the annual PSS meeting. Um, and so we're also just searching to have a wider community of scholars participating with us online. You can find us on our website, so you'll be able to find this recording there, as well as on the Peace Science website. And we do also have uh, formerly Twitter, I guess now X as well. Um, so today we have a fantastic paper that is entitled News Media Reporting Patterns and Our Biased Understanding of Global Unrest. And this is going to be presented to us by Andrew Shaver, who is from the University of California, Merced. Um, and he has many fantastic co-authors on this paper, uh, all of whom I will not list, but I do encourage you um, to take a look at the paper and, and check those out. We also have a wonderful discussant. We have Ideen Selian from the University of North Texas, uh, who is also our Peace Science Society president. Uh, and so we are excited to have this paper and to discuss it today. I will also be discussing, um, and then we will open up for everyone else. Um, I see people coming into the call to uh, join us with questions and to, to have critiques and comments for Andrew as well. <laughs> So attendees, you are welcome to leave comments or questions in the chat as they come to you. So you don't have to wait or hold on to it, but you are also welcome to do that. Um, if there is time, which there should be in this case, following the flow of the discussion and our discussants, uh, the so, so I will incorporate comments from the chat into the discussion so I can happily you know, call on you if you've dropped them in there. Um, we will prioritize comments from our discussants, but we will certainly save all of the information that happens in the chat to make sure that the presenter, uh, in this case, Andrew, can uh, receive all of the excellent feedback. So Andrew is going to present to us for about 15 minutes, and then I'll have Ideen deliver his comments, and then I will do the same. So let's go ahead and we will get started. So Andrew, I'm going to mute myself, turn it over to you, and, and hear all about your great work. Wonderful. Uh, Chelsea, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful, Ideen, in advance for your comments as well, um, and just generally to you all for affording the opportunity uh, for, 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 for me to join you and, and for my co-authors vicariously um, as well today. So, so thank you in advance. Um, this is a very large project, as Chelsea mentioned, with a number of co-authors. And in fact, I'm going to present not just this work, but um, a little bit of Work that has followed because this is this project now has been in the works for quite some time. Um, so this co-author co-author list is is actually even longer than than than, than this first paper. Um, uh, so so the the focus of this project, um, as the title suggests, is really thinking about how the news media reports um, on political violence uh, and social unrest around the world, um, and sort of whether and how that matters. Um, but before I before I kind of get into the presentation. Uh, specifically um, on this project, I wanted to first start off with some broader kind of motivating um, statistics that come from uh, sort of a broader body of work that I'm engaged on, thinking about the major international news media and its uh, influence um, uh, uh, on sort of academics and policymakers kind of more broadly. And then I'll turn more specifically to this question of how the news media potentially influence how we understand political violence specifically. So uh, this this first graph that I've I've got here um, is a is uh, depicts a response to it to a, a set of surveys that we recently carried out in which we asked um, international relations faculty across the United States at colleges and universities in which we uh, surveyed current and former senior government officials engaged in national security foreign policy making um, across the past three presidential administrations, um, at least. Um, some of these we, we sampled based on those administrations, but some of them may currently remain in office. Some of them may have been in office well, prior to the past three administrations. Um, and then finally, uh, we reached out to think tank staffers um, at major think tanks across the United States that have a foreign affairs focus, not the think tank necessarily, but the staffers themselves. Um, and, and what we asked them first was, 
basically the extent to which the major international news media is a primary source of information about uh, international affairs for them. And in addition to the news media, we listed a variety of other potential sources that are likely to be primary sources as well. And what we've plotted here in blue are the percentages of people listing media as at least one of their major sources, right? So the first kind of takeaway here is really significant reliance on the news media generally. Um, but what I found particularly striking is the dark blue um, bar here, which represents the set of individuals or the percentage of each um, class of individuals that indicated that they rely only on the news media as their primary source of international affairs. Um, more than one in three of, of these most senior government officials um, right, indicating, listing only the major news media. So the, the first kind of thing that I want to paint here is, is this clear picture, and, and I've seen, I think we've seen this in, in sort of less direct ways in some other research, that when it comes to foreign affairs information, you know, the news media is a, a major source for lots of people engaged in the teaching, research, advising on, or even implementation of foreign affairs. Um, the, the next question we asked was, um, are the major international news media reporting on issues kind of holistically, or do these um, do the same set of international affairs profession professionals minus the professors uh, for whom we didn't have space on the survey? Um, when it comes to uh, issues uh, taking place around the world, do they perceive major gaps in the reporting? In particular, are there major major issues that are going effectively underreported or unreported? And what you can see in this top set of of plots here is that amongst the senior government officials and the IR think tank staffers, there is a clear consensus that the, the major international news media is omitting major topics in their reporting. Uh, these lower bars uh, are where we ask about the, the individual's own work. Is your own work reported in the news media? Yes, no, or sort of a yes, but with many caveats around nuance and so forth. And so we, on the one hand, we have lots of reliance on the news media. On the other hand, we have sort of a recognition at the same time that lots of major issues are going missed. And then finally, we ask these same two, latter two set of uh, professionals, to what extent is the major international news media influencing causally the work they do? And especially the senior government officials depict uh, a pretty strong causal influence of the media on their work. Um, here, a 10 represents very, very significant causal impact. Zero rep represents none. So you can see the, the distribution, at least amongst the, the senior government officials, is pretty heavily skewed toward more rather than less causal impact of news reporting. So I think we have a lot of kind of pic uh, pictures here that the news media matter, um, but at the same time, the news media might be missing critical information that's reporting. And then finally, we went out again to the same set of international relations faculty, this time carrying out a second survey in which we asked them, number one, do you teach, uh, do you treat the major international news media as an actor when you teach? Um, and the idea here was hopefully to capture international relations professors or professors teaching IR courses to think about like, is the IR coming up for them, maybe like sub-state actors would or state actors and so forth as, as an actor in international affairs. Um, and, and the majority, 73% say no, they don't. In contrast, exactly the opposite proportion, 73% indicate that they do rely on news products in their teaching or research. So again, we almost have this picture within the academy of a lot of reliance on the news media even as we don't treat the news media collectively as kind of a, a major actor in international affairs. So uh, I'm gonna argue that one way in which the news media matters that I think is, has escaped attention is the role of news media as serving as a fundamental input into data sets that are used not only by academics, but are used by government officials, by think tank, by think tank analysts and others in carrying out analysis that then ultimately potentially influ influences decision-making itself. Um, and this seems to happen in a wide variety of domains and uh, economic domains, human rights domains and others. I'm going to talk obviously about political violence today, um, but I'll note that um, even as like AI comes online, right, um, I think there's a big discussion to be had here around like the extent to which AI is pulling lots of its content largely from the news media and then reflecting back answers that we asked it. And at some point you sort of get these um this 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 distance between sort of what the ai is producing and what was reported initially such that it may be harder and harder to identify the potential systematic um biases introduced by skewed reporting um okay so today i'm really focused on um news reporting on political violence and social unrest um why why, why do we care about this well because as everyone on this call knows, these are like the central input into major conflict event data sets that um, you know, are the basis for 
I don't know, thousands of studies, at least there are thousands of citations to these data sets suggesting that they're being used in potentially thousands of studies. Um, data sets like the armed conflict location event data set, ACLID, which I've plotted here uh, for East Africa and, and, and the Yemen region of the Middle East. Um, and, and so the question is basically how, how well do these data sets do? Um, how well, to what extent do they reflect the world sort of as it is and to what extent do they not? Um, and I'll, I, this, I think this quote from a staff writer at the New York Times that we, we talked to sort of captures things nicely, who mentioned, you know, there's a lot of violence that happens and it all can't be written about uh, because not everything should be written about. We are not just a chronicle of all events that took place over the course of the day. So the question is, you know, are these conflict event data sets systematically missing violence? Um, and our approach to, to doing this is to first um, reach out and just an in, in interview a wide variety of wartime correspondents and others who have um, experienced reporting on conflict around the world in countries that I have listed here, um, and doing so for many of the world's largest news agencies, many of the news agencies that are, are indeed relied upon for information for these conflict event data sets. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the existing conflict event data sets, we're going to systematically compare them to high quality administrative data that we've gotten from places like Iraq, Afghanistan, the Philippines, uh, South Africa. Um, we're going to identify that there, sure enough, are a series of, um, uh, of, of types of patterns of violence that are missing systematically. And then we're going to ask, does this matter? Are these systematic these patterns of systematic missingness enough to influence statistical results? And so the way we do this is carry out what we call a reverse replication, in which we take studies published in many of the leading economics and political science journals, uh, which I have listed here, we, which are based on some of these high quality administrative data, and then effectively ask if we were to if we were to have carried out these same studies, but only had available to us the media data, would we have uncovered the same set of results? So hence the idea here, not of a replication, but of a reverse replication. Um, and, and so I'm just going to try to, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I know we're already getting short on time. But the, the guiding logic of the project is basically that if there is consistent error in, uh, or it's just, it's consistent missingness in the media reporting, that will then lead to consistent error in the data sets, within, which then may lead to spurious inf inferences. When we use those data, um, the way we think about bias uh, in, in the media reporting is in the form of both editorial and capa capability bias. Um, editorial bias, as the name suggests, is going to be any case in which the news media is systematically learning about events but choosing not to report them for any number of reasons. I won't go into all of the types um, that we, we learned about in the course of our interviews, but simply will note that there, there are many. There are a large variety of reasons that journalists will often learn about an event but choose not to report the event. Here I'm giving just a few examples of uh, preferential coverage for particular victims um, uh, from cases like Iraq and um, the Palestinian territories in Israel. Um, this, this, this second quote actually came to us more than a year ago at this point, if I recall correctly, uh, but I included because it's obviously very timely as, yeah. as conflict is now you know, very intense between Hamas um, and, is, and, and Israel. Um, so we see preferences for deadly events, large events, uh, particular types of violence seem to be more likely to be covered than others, particular targets, particular geographies, um, so on and so forth. And then the other type of bias we think about is a capability bias. The idea here is not that the media have made a choice not to report something, uh, but rather they were simply restricted from reporting on it in the first place. Um, we see a lot of variation within countries where certain countries are just more difficult to access than others. So you would get underreporting in those areas for safety reasons, for bud budgetary reasons, for a variety of reasons. But we also see very, very significant differences across countries. Um, so I've put a quote here from uh, a journalist who we interviewed working for one of the world's largest news agencies, who was actually the D Yemen desk officer. So his job was to report on the country of Yemen for this, for this very large news agency. And he basically explained that for 18 months, he was never never able to even go to Yemen in the first place because he could never get a visa. Um, and it was during this period of the, the Saudi campaign, so a lot of a lot of death, a lot of destruction, tragically, um, that was probably going undocumented. In contrast, he talked about if he wanted to go to Ukraine, he could like literally catch a flight the next day, go to Poland, cross the border, and start reporting. Um, so um, the, the data, I think I'm, I'll just kind of gloss over this because because I know we're already getting short on time, but the data that we compare against are, are, are um, high quality administrative data released by the US Defense Department for the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and then the campaign against um, um, ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna take those. Um, here's a plot of the, the campaign against ISIS in, uh, in Iraq and Syria 
just for sort of uh, visual purposes. Uh, we also, in a collaboration with Joe Felter, bring in data from the Philippines that he collected through a pretty uh, extensive engagement with that country's military and police forces. Um, and then and then we bring in publicly available data from the South African police force, um, pl police service, excuse me, on protest and riot activity. Um, and then we go through and we kind of think in each of these cases what the observable implications of um, our interviews with the journalists would be in terms of specific types of underreporting. So I won't go through those in depth here, um, but just to say that there are a bunch of them. And, and then we go through and we basically systematically compare. Um, so here, what I've done is simply plotted, um, in the case of Iraq and, and Syria, the U.S. campaign against ISIS, the number of reports, I think those are GED reports in the in the red, uh, the, the blue are the U.S. Defense Department reports, um, again, subsetting to like events here. So we're only comparing airstrikes to airstrikes. Um, and, you know, the very, very first thing that really comes through here is just how much missingness there is. Uh, but then, sure enough, when we test for the systematic types of missingness that we expect, we see lots of evidence of those. Um, do they matter? I, I'm sorry, the screen's a little bit difficult to read, but this is basically our set of reverse replication results where we go through and reverse replicate those, those um, set of articles I talked about before. And uh, we, we come up with scores. We, we do our best to try to you know, kind of evaluate, did they, rever did they replicate or not? Um, but in short, I think something like 70% of the results are not recoverable. Uh, if you use the media-based data suggesting that these, these differences in reporting are pretty substantial and meaningful. Um, what I really wanted to do for this presentation, I know I'm super short on time now, is just kind of actually go beyond what we had done previously um, to some more recent work. Um, so um, Chelsea, Chelsea asked before the, the presentation to maybe give some, some thoughts on where feedback might be helpful. Um, and so one piece of feedback we had gotten was, um, you know, to what extent can we rely on the security force records? Do they have their own internal biases? And, and I can, I have, I you know, have a number of answers to that and I'm happy to have that conversation. But one way I thought about addressing this was, well, could we turn to other sources besides security force records and see if we uh, uncover comparable types of systematic missingness? So, so one thing we've done is we've um, engaged with Rewe. Uh, this is a survey firm that carries out online surveys around the world. They use a very kind of interesting technology where effectively people encounter a broken web address and they're actually then prompted to take a survey. Um, so what's what's kind of compelling about this this there are a number of obviously questions about this strategy but 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 a couple of compelling features of the strategy is that number one it allows them to reach otherwise very potentially difficult to reach populations uh, in countries around the world so long as they have access to the to the internet um, and two their their approach um, is entirely anonymous so uh, people are um, basically to, like told that this is an anonymous survey. They're not asked for any ident personally identifiable information. Um, and, and what I've plotted here are the results of a survey in which um, uh, individuals across Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria were basically asked about the observance of protest activity. I've then plotted that against ACLID's report of protest activity on the y-axis. And they're not, it's not an apples to apples comparison in the sense that we're not counting from the survey respondents the number of protests because we don't know, you know, if two respondents from a given district in a given week, for example, reported a protest. We don't know if they're reporting separate protests or different protests. But what we can really identify here are those cases in which there's a, 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 a report of at least one uh, protest and which there are no reported protests by the conflict event media based data. And those are all of these kind of um, diamond looking. Uh, points on the on the on the um, the zero y, y equals zero line here, so so we we estimate this to be under reporting by the news media. And sure enough, when we look at whether there's an urban bias, like we expect, and we see in um, our use of security force records, we see the same thing. Um, and then then the the other thing we did, um, and then I'll I'll wrap up here is we um, we said what if we actually went and worked with journalists directly? Um, what if we hired journalists because we know that they're learning about lots of events because they tell us that aren't getting reported. What if we were to hire them for say a month and then look at what they reported when they were basically not constrained in what they, in what they were reporting. Um, and so we, we contracted local journalists um, who have all reported for major news agencies from Bangladesh, Kenya, Mozambique, you can see the entire list here. Um, and happy to get more into what we find in the, in the question and answer session, but I'll just leave you with this um, slide here from Pakistan where we have, plotted in red the reports that come from ACLIT of political violence, social unrest. We've plotted in blue 
the reports that were coming from our journalists that were hired for this one month reporting period. And you just start to see just like big, big differences in what's ending up in the news media versus what's getting what what these journalists are learning about, but not otherwise necessarily reporting and publishing. Um, this for anyone who who studies Pakistan, you might recognize this is the Balochistan province in particular. Um, apparently, uh, the journalists who worked for us there indicated that uh, after the after the the withdrawal of the U.S. Uh, U.S. forces from Afghanistan, a lot of weapons have. Uh, been smuggled into Pakistan, into the Balochistan region, where it's being used to help fuel the insurgency there. Um, so it seems like just a, a, a pretty significant armed um, uh, conflict occurring in Balochistan is receiving just very little news media attention, um, but getting picked up if you collaborate directly with the journalists. Uh, we see kind of similar but different patterns in the other countries we worked on, but I thought this was the most striking, so I, I chose to share it. Um, Chelsea, I think I'm I think I'm out of time, so maybe I'll just wrap it up there. Um, and, uh, in terms of any kind of feedback, um, you know, um, this, this, this article is currently, um, R and R. Um, so sorry, well, actually we received a very nice reject and resubmit. Um, so we're working on that now. Um, um, but, but hopefully, hopefully can turn that around. So, um, we're sort of at the stage where, you know, it's still, there's still enough time to re for revision that if there are kind of broader points, those would be helpful, but also at the point too, where, um, I Dean or others, if you have like very kind of targeted suggestions on um, kind of the way we're we're carrying out tests or additional tests we might carry out and so forth, that that could also be very helpful. So, fantastic! Thank you so much, Andrew. That was great. Uh, and I was approaching the cut you off moment, but you did you did great on time. So no worries. Um, so I'll turn it over to I Dean now for his comments. All right, great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> clearly, you've identified an important uh, problem. Um, and those of us that are in the data collection space, we, we are aware that uh, underreporting, misreporting is an issue. Um, and I think you've done a very nice job of empirically highlighting uh, some of the gaps in our knowledge. And I, I love the uh, interviews with journalists and, and thinking about the reporting process. So all of that is good. And there's obviously stuff in this presentation that wasn't in the paper. So I mainly comment on what was in the in the paper, but we can have a broader conceptual discussion about what this all means. Um, so, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to think where this piece fits in the broader literature, because primarily you're identifying that this is, uh, a, a problem of underreporting. So, um, right now I'm going to drop into the chat, uh, a list of citations that I've identified the same problem. And we can go. We can go back to 1997, a piece by Carol Mueller um, that um, you know also mentions this. There's work by Nils Weidman. There's work by Scott Cook, who's uh, thought about this. Jennifer Earle in sociology. So you know, one one of the issues here is is we know that this is an issue. So what are you uncovering um, with this project that's new that that has not been identified before? We know that the news media is selective in the reporting. We know that they're constrained on space. We know that there's issues with urban bias. We know there, the if it bleeds, it leads problem, right? So um, the, the problem has already been identified. And I think the literature is well beyond noting that this is an issue. And I think we're now searching for solutions for what to do about it. So that that is really where I would, I would press you to go. Um, so underreporting is a problem that we know about. The other issue that we know about is, is misreporting or inconsistent reporting. And there's work by Nils Weidman, uh, for example. Uh, but you know, if you look in communication studies as well, uh, the source you use very much shape your impression of, of what happened. So are the journalists calling it a riot or a protest? What language are they using? Uh, estimates of casualties, for example, could be uh, wildly different depending on the news source. Um, so there's the 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 underreporting issue, which you identify. There's also the misclassification issue, which is sort of not in in the paper, but what is reported can be inconsistent across sources. But again, this is stuff that we know that people working in the space, people that are collecting data, thinking about media reporting, have already identified the problem, and I think we're we're again beyond identification and now looking at solutions. So let, let's talk about some of the solutions and some of my, my thoughts about this. 
um, before I get into more nitpicky things. Um, you know, the first solution, and uh, you know, some people in sociology have suggested this, that 1997 piece that I dropped in the chat um, says we should just give up on news reporting. That news reporting is, is biased, news organizations have their own incentives to report things or not. Um, so we should just give up. I don't think that's a, a viable solution. We have to use the news media to, to some extent to, to, to gather our information. Um, so giving up is, is sort of not one problem, is, is not one solution. Um, the second solution is pretend it's not a problem and proceed. Um, obviously that's not ideal, but I, I'm, I'm actually gonna suggest that pretending it's not a problem and proceeding for certain applications is not as bad as we think. So are we, as political scientists, social scientists, really concerned about the true number of events? That there were this many events, uh, 120 events in this province? Or are we more concerned in, in the way we construct our theories and the way we construct hypotheses about relative frequencies? Is it enough to say that more violence is happening in Mosul versus Erbil? We don't may not have the exact count, and we're honest that we don't have the exact count of the the proper number of events. But we can look at across space that this region is experiencing more violence than that region, or more violence, or more uh, contentious activity is happening around certain events, like an election. So we're looking at relative frequencies compared to a baseline, rather than trying to count the actual number of events. And I would suggest that a lot of the a lot of the events in SIGACs are actually not things that as social scientists we care about. Well, what we're not doing is trying to unpack uh, battlefield strategies. A lot of the stuff in SIGACs, and I've seen this, are are things like um, a bomb exploded, but it didn't kill anybody. Right? Is that something that our theories are, are equipped to to handle? Um, or are equipped to to really analyze, or you know, um, some of the very very minor protests that are happening in say South Africa that that attract fifty people or so on that might get onto the police data, but are not big regime shaking events. They're not uh, events that are disrupting the economy or shaping politics in meaningful ways. They're they're small events. They're not being reported. Uh, in the international news media because they're not newsworthy, as you suggest, but they're also not really worthy of our theoretical attention. You know, most of us are, are concerned about, you know, big um, regime shaking, uh, shaking events, major episodes of violence, major episodes of, of contention, um, and not getting at like the nuances of, of the proper account. So as long as we're clear that, that, you know, our theories are focused on a particular class of events, and we're not um, trying to unpack, again, battlefield tactics. I think we can do with media data as long as we understand its proper role. The other kind of um, uh, more technical uh, solutions to, to this, which I, I wish the paper would explore, are using uh, techniques like multi multiple recapture techniques that are borrowed from biology and animal population modeling, um, you know, I've done some work on this. It's again in that in the chat. Uh, Scott Cook has got a couple of uh, papers. Um, Scott Cook at A and M that try to adopt a, a multiple recapture type methodology to understanding um, uh, misreporting and getting the true counts. There's another um, uh, approach from biology that I think is very promising, which is called occupancy modeling, which tries to get at. Um, geographic distribution of animal populations, but we could also do this for, for events. So we're now looking at those sort of technical statistical solutions. Another potential solution that I've adopted in some of my work um, is, is trying to correct for media effort, understanding how many journalists are there, how, how much reporting overall is happening in this space, in this country, let's say. Um, and trying to um, use media effort um, to correct for some of the at least cross national biases, although you could do that in other ways as well, um, that are that are inherent in the in the media reporting process. But there are a number of solutions that people have have toyed with and played with, and I think that is sort of the cutting edge of of where this work is going. Right? Is like what do we do about this issue? Um, okay. Um, 
I'm going to hit a couple of other points before I get to the big conceptual issue. And this is for the audience and whoever's watching. Um, so the other thing with the uh, with the media source data, and you're using GTD, IQs, uh, and SCAD. You also mentioned ACLID in the in the supplementary stuff. Um, these three, these four data sources have very different event ontologies, or what is actually being called an event. So, for example, IQs, their deduplication procedure is if if they have multiple stories about um, a particular location and day. They collapse that into a single event record. Um, ACLID also, for example, if a protest lasts seven days, that becomes seven events in ACLID. Whereas a source like SCAD, what we do is we basically aggregate up to like a more campaign level. So one event can last multiple days. So we could have differences in counts across data sets um, just because they have different ontologies for what is an event. ACLID also disaggregates um, uh, by space. So for example, the, the Arab Spring protests in Egypt in ACLID would be number of locations times number of days. So that's going to give you a much larger number of events, whereas SCAD, for example, would have one event that happens in multiple locations, or is coded as nationwide, really, and lasts multiple days. So just the count is kind of misleading if they have very different event ontologies. Um, other kind of minor point, you know, I think that re reverse replication exercise is, is interesting, but it's, but um, we're taking studies that had better data that were using SIGAX and then trying to replicate them with worse data. So it was, it was a little bit puzzling, like, why would you even do that? Why would you go to the, to the worst data? I would actually, you know, push you to, to look at in those reverse replications, under what scenarios could we replicate those results? Like if we parse the data into say fatal events, does the media work just as good as SIGAX, right? The media is not gonna capture, like I said, the, the roadside bomb that exploded and didn't kill anybody. But if we parse the data in a certain way and said, okay, the, the media actually does a pretty good job of reporting these particular types of events and we can replicate um, data on Iraq or the Philippines or Afghanistan with media data, given these parameters and given these criteria, um, this is an appropriate use of media data. And I think that would, uh, you know, move toward the solutions. And then kind of a, a last bigger conceptual point before I turn it over to, to Chelsea. Um, Look, I'm a person that's collected disaggregated data on rebel groups, on uh, on protest events and so on. But I do sort of, I'm kind of concerned in our peace science community um, and the conflict studies community at large that we're sort of fetishizing disaggregation to a point where it's not appropriate anymore. You know, we, we used to have, when I was a graduate student, just country year data, and we thought that was pretty good. Um, and, you know, there, there's problems with country year data and, and disagreements over what constitutes a civil war or not. But we can say at a maximum level of aggregation with pretty much certainty that a civil war happened in this country in this year. Now, when we're trying to get down to this particular longitude and latitude point on this particular day, right, the more we disaggregate, the more measurement error becomes an issue. And I think as a community, we're almost disaggregating to the point at which our theories are not really at that level anymore. Are we really concerned that, you know, an attack happened on this street corner in Baghdad on this particular day, right? I think we're, we're kind of, again, they're interesting for certain purposes, but most of our theories, most of the our data on our independent variables don't match that, that level of disaggregation. Um, and we're disaggregating by space and by time and by actor to a very minute level because it's cool and trendy, but it's not necessarily where, where our theories are and our theories haven't been at that very micro, micro level. We're sort of thinking about theorizing larger political processes that might affect entire countries or, or shape regimes or electoral strategies. So if we just re-aggregate up to something like a provincial level or an annual or monthly level, do we 
the some of the noisiness in our data and the and the um the the lack of data precision do we do we solve some of the problems by not looking at such a detailed microscope is is what i'm trying to get at um so anyway i think i've gone over time now <laughs> <laughs> so I'll I'll leave it to uh, to Chelsea and then um, we'll we'll get your your response to that. Thanks, Idean. Yeah, um, I that's a, I'm going to be thinking about that large conceptual question for a little bit here. So um, it's a good one. Um, so Andrew, I I really enjoyed reading this paper. Um, I'm glad to hear that it has uh, an R and R, whether it be regardless of what those R's are. I think that's great. Um, so so and and this is also in line with the type of comments I had. You know, I, I sort of anticipated that the paper was was quite uh, at least under review. So uh, so good. Um, so I have two kind of big areas of of things, uh, and then a couple of little smaller things that may help with you know kind of packaging and framing. Um, so the the first thing was that I. I did just want to see more discussion of potential issues or limitations in the type of data that you are comparing the media data to. Um, so I certainly think that the paper is is helped by you know you're you're not just using SIGACs. You have you have sort of three very different what we might consider convenient samples, I guess, of government recording, right? So you have the the SIGACs, you have the JOC, and then you have um, I don't recall what the the South African protest data or the police data is called, um, and so I, I think that you I think you need to first of all you should mention that you should say I I acknowledge that these are all you know sources that may have their own sets of biases, but I have three different very different ones, very different contexts, um, and so I'm going to show you that we find similar patterns across those three. I think that is something that should add some leverage. Um, but I, but I also just would like to see you, you know, kind of acknowledge these, any possible sources of biases that conflict scholars should be aware of almost more theoretically and rather than, rather than in a methodological space. Um, so I guess what I mean by that is, you know, I, I am convinced by what you have demonstrated, um, and also by, you know, the set of previous work that Adine had put in the chat that, news is going to underreport violence and that when conflict actors or state actors are present in conflict they may simply have a better list of you know events that have happened um so i i'm, I'm sufficiently convinced of that but that said um you know i i come from a space of working on on homicide data and uh, and and looking at you know criminal interactions and things like that and in most of the places that I work on, government data is very much not to be trusted. And the sources of bias in you know, state provided data are not to be taken lightly, um, which, you know, which is not to say that conflict scholars don't still do that because it's the only available source of data. But still, um, I would like to see more of a discussion of just like, how do we conceptually or even in building a research design, you know, compare possible sources of bias. Um, this is getting a little bit to some of Ideen's points about, you know, really when, um, even if the magnitude is drastically different in the number of, of events we're capturing, wh when might we want to have additional caution or like provide, you know, kind of a cautionary note on on using things like the SIGAX data in as, a couple of specific ways. Um, so, you know, it was interesting to me, or I, I buy that as violence intensity increases, we are less able to capture each individual event. Um, I'm not necessarily sure why the increase in violence intensity would not also affect state or police. Um, I think that I can see how you might be able, they might be able to say, well, we, will, we were there, so we know something happened. But again, the details of that event, as things become more intense, that seems almost like a that's just going to be a problem with observability, right? So, so that I, I don't know that I'm sufficiently convinced there. Um, as well, uh, you know, you mentioned, um, oh, well, these data, especially for the the SIGAX data, there's standard operating procedures, so we should be able to trust that they're they're rigorous in their their capture, and there there is no, um, you don't suggest there's no bias, but you know, something along those lines. Um, but I don't have a, a a good description of those standard operating procedures. Um, and as someone who does not have a military background, I think that might, you know, lend some credence to, to the claim here. Um, I also wondered a little bit about, um, you know, sort of spatial sources of bias. So, you know, do, do the U.S. forces have access to all areas? And you mentioned this in terms of cities or in terms of heavily populated places where journalists are more likely to be able to observe things. Um, but I think you could push further, perhaps even as you move these, these other projects forward, 
on, you know, how do we think about territorial access and observability, even if we're using actor specific data? So what might be some issues present um, with these other types? Um, and then finally, um, you know, as you're as you're using police data, um, I would imagine that there are probably interests of the South African police to report in certain ways as well. Um, I just I think, you know, often government uh, government data is going to have its own uh, sort of purpose and sources of bias. So I would, I would just like to see that addressed. I do not think in any way that that is uh, a limitation for the paper. I just think it should be be better covered. And then the second, so that's sort of one big umbrella of things. Uh, the second thing that I'd, I'd like to see more of, and it's clearly the, the direction that you are going with the additional projects and the more recent work, so that's awesome, is I just, I'd like to just know more about, uh, you know, kind of what is your suggestion outside of these three data sources. Yeah, for, so you see where I'm going with this. Um, you know, so so what what types of sources are comparable if you think that, you know, the SIGAX, JOC, uh, these types of data are really what we need to be doing? Um, are we talking any government data? Are we talking, you know, data from NGOs perhaps, from UN, um, you know, peacekeeping operations to the extent that those could be available? I'm not sure. Um, so what fits, you know, uh, what is the suggestion for conflict scholars to move this forward? I also was curious, and this is actually more of an issue with um, the accumulation of the media-based data sets. So this is perhaps not that helpful, um, but you, you know, so to what extent is this just about Western media um, and kind of like the big news sources, you know, and you even, you have this quote on page 12 about, well, this would have been a big story in Israeli or Palestinian media. Um, and so perhaps something here is, you know, we, we should be focusing much more on actual local sources that um, are likely to to not suffer from quite the same amount of like editorial bias, I guess, or different forms of editorial bias. Um, a final kind of big point that I think is just kind of is kind of just glossed over in the paper is a lot of this doesn't seem to be about attacks on civilians. I think those sorts of attacks have very different sources of bias. And I think all forms of data are probably going to be prone to underreporting on, you know, smaller acts of, of, of violence against civilians. Um, but I do think that some of the things that you're doing, you know, by like crowdsourcing or it's not really what it is, but sort of asking people to weigh in on these different events and then and following up further with journalists um, help get get a sense of the the scope of, of what should we be doing, right? Um, very small, uh, I guess, other things. Um, the hypotheses seem um, almost a little too general for me at the 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 their placement in the paper as well. I wondered if they could be a, a little bit later. So, so in particular, uh, the second hypothesis is basically making a claim that you can observe non observability the way that I read it. You know, so I think that the the news media uh, title in there is doing a lot of work. You know, you say these are these are less likely to be discovered. Uh, and it's sort of like, well, how do how do we know that they can be discovered if that makes sense? So I think if you could if you could hypothesize about the specific ways in which they are less likely to be discovered by media, then my issue here goes away. Um, I wanted you to uh, be a little more clear about. So you mentioned the 2016 uh, Weidman AJPS article in the like, oh, this has been done, but we're you know we're we're doing better things sort of. Um, maybe be a little more clear. Is this just about you have you know, quite a broader scope. You're testing this on different, you know, I'd, I'd like to see, this is in line with, uh, you know, Dean mentioning the, the many times that other people have done this. What exactly is the, the real innovation here, perhaps in that section? Um, I think you could move um, the figure on page 25, which is in the start of the results quite a bit earlier as almost a kind of motivation for like getting people to buy in. This is just the raw comparison of number of events reported um, between the, because I think, you know, your paper is, is really more about kind of like teasing out these sources of bias, I think, um, or at least that's the impression that I got. And so I, I would almost move that up, um, and, and use it as like, Hey, just visually, like, does this pass the, you know, the, the kind of ocular test of, Hey, what we're doing is really important. I think that would motivate the paper quite well. Um, and finally, this is my, my last thing. Uh, I, I wondered, I don't know if this is feasible, could you put the plots um, when you do break down the different sources of bias on the same scale? I don't know if you'll be able to see the the kind of differentiation by source of bias, if that makes sense. But 
you know, just from glancing at them, I don't get, I had to, you know, really check the y-axis to say, oh, wow, like just like, what's the difference in magnitude or the difference in like scale of reporting here? So if you can, I would recommend doing that. Okay, I'm going to be quiet and uh, and see if we have any um, comments from the audience. And if we do not, Andrew, if there's anything that you, or in the meantime, while people are thinking, let's put it that way, if there's anything that you would like to follow up on or or ask about further, feel free. And then folks can can jump into the chat or just you know raise a hand or whatever. We'll get them on the list. Uh, absolutely. Um, maybe what I can do to while while folks think here, if they have a question, is um, just share a few of the uh, since since a lot of your uh, both Idine and 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 your comments are around sort of. So what, what do we do about this problem? Maybe share a little bit more about what we have done so far, uh, which has gone a very different direction than what um, Ideen um, was sort of suggesting. So that, that might be kind of interesting. Would that be reasonable? I don't know how you all normally use that. Okay. Um, so, so I mentioned, I kind of, uh, it was a little rushed here. So I mentioned the work that we've done directly with journalists um, to sort of understand what they are picking up on that's, um, that's indeed learned about, but not reported. And we, again, see some pretty um, some pretty big differences there. Um, uh, another thing that we, and this maybe Ideen goes to, to some of what you you were raising in terms of, of, you know, sort of supplementing these data, using them more effectively. The other thing we realized in the course of our discussions with these journalists was that a lot, especially when it comes more to social unrest. So here we're talking less about kind of attacks with with small arms and so forth, but thinking more in the domain of protest activity, demonstration activity, riot activity, so on and so forth. Um, what what a lot of what a number of journalists kind of remarked about was the difference in um, the likelihood of picking up these type of events with written news articles, which um, you know, I think is the backbone of a lot of these conflict event data sets versus going out and covering these events with photo or 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 video um, uh, efforts. And so uh, another thing that we did in this sort of second project was take eleven countries around the world. We then engaged with the video and photo uh, records uh, associated with the or belonging to the Associated Press and to Agence France Press. Um, first, just looking at are there, you know, to what extent are there events that are being picked up in photos and videos that are not being picked up in written article? Um, and then number two, are they systematically different? And so that's actually what we've we've depicted here. Um, so the, the first answer to that is like yes, when you look at the set of events that are picked up by photo and video. Uh, it, it really varies across country, but what we've depicted here are the in gray are newly identified events for a given country. Um, so sure enough, like the photo videos are picking up a lot of um, additional activity. Uh, but then importantly, are those missed events systematically different? Uh, and, and the answer here is, is yes. Um, when we look specifically along the dimension of, of violence, um, the missed events are less likely to be violent, um, which gets to sort of Ideen's another point that he raised around like do we care does it map on a theory but um and and i could i'd be happy to respond to that um but uh but sure enough we find that um that there's pretty systematic difference so um so i think that's another and, and what's really kind of exciting about this approach i think um is that it's scalable right um you can they have these, these photo records these photo video records exist now um uh, and it's not just the afp and agence friends uh, AFP, but, um, you know, Reuters, I think, collects, um, um, you know, collects these sort of rec records, e the European press agency, I think it's called Deutsche, uh, I think the Deutsche Press uh, Agency, like a number of these efforts around the world. So presumably this effort could be like scaled up, not only geographically, but temporally to really augment a lot of the existing data sets. Um, so, so yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I can keep going here, but maybe that gives time to see if anyone else had questions. Yeah, so so that's the direction I would push you to go, right? It, you know, obviously we can't contract with journalists. You know, I, I, for a large number of cases, trying to do all of Africa or all of Latin America, we can't do that. But what what you could do, and the one of the pieces that I uh, marked in here uh, by me and Cullen, also replicates this, right? Events that that draw in a lot of people and that create fatalities are almost certainly likely to be reported. 
So if you can say something based on what you've done with these journalists and say, okay, these types of events are almost all of them are going to appear in the international news, whereas these other classes of events, there's systematic missingness. Then we can say for this class of events or these event types, the media source news is pretty fine, is, is fine. Now, when we're trying to drill down into small events that happen in rural areas that don't kill anybody, well, now you're going to have a lot more noise in your data, a lot more messiness in your data. But as long as you restrict your analysis to certain categories of events, international news media is actually pretty good at, at reporting. Um, you know, the other thing that you might want to mention about SIGAX, and this can come out in the paper, is that the journalists are not going to Mosul and Ir Irbil and Fallujah. They're getting a press briefing by usually a colonel in Baghdad in the green zone. And that colonel is sort of saying, okay, 300 events happened today. These are the three most important ones, right? So is, so is it good enough for us as researchers to focus on the three most important ones? Um, obviously, as Chelsea mentioned, and I agree that that current that whoever's doing that press briefing has their own reasons to to filter that information, right? They're not going to talk about uh, an accidental airstrike on a wedding party or a kid's birthday, right? They're not going to want that to appear in the media. So there's that bias as well, right? But if there are certain sort of categories of events that we say, hey, the news media is actually pretty good, let's let's focus on these types of events and kind of recognize that these other types of events are very spotty in their reporting. You know, that's offering a type of solution. Okay, I will make another call to if anyone in the uh, in the audience would like to um, offer any questions or suggestions for Andrew. Okay, this is always like, you know, when you're teaching and you're like, I, how long do I wait? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, well, Andrew, is there anything else you'd like us to, or Ideen for that matter, is there anything else that we'd like to, oh, yay, thank you, Clara. Um, okay, uh, uh, Andrew, I think you can see the question in the chat, yes? Or I will also read it for those who are, are you know, might be watching this at a later date. Um, so Clara asks, is there any reason you are ruling out crowdsourcing and citizen journalism? as data sources to compare. Yeah, no, Greg, thank you. Thank you, Clara. Um, uh, no, no, definitely not ruling it out. Um, it, some, a lot of this has just been um, feasibility or practicality of, of trying to, um, of actually identify sort of alternative collection methods that we might bring to bear here. Um, so it's something we've talked about doing. Um, my, one concern, right, is obviously like, what kind of, what's the data generating process with, with that crowdsourcing? Are there, you know, what are its own potential biases? Are there potential incentives to misrepresent it? Could it be, could it be skewed by nefarious government actors that actually want to, you know, go into the data and um, and report things that aren't happening for whatever reason? Um, which may seem unlikely, but um, I have some other work from Iraq, a little different context, but um, where we look at um, the collection of tips of uh, wartime informing by um, government forces during the Iraq War. Um, and it's it's extraordinary how how concerted the efforts were of the insurgents to effectively tie up those tips hotlines and either to stop them from receiving information by like literally calling these tips hotlines and just tying up the, the phone line. So so legitimate tippers could not get through or in many cases or in some cases, like actually supplying misinformation or disinformation through those tip hotlines. Um, so that that would be, I think, the the sort of general concern here, um, the the. Um, Another thing that's, that comes up in the paper um, is, um, and, and, and Chelsea, you brought this up too, so maybe I can speak to this, is relying on local, you know, to what extent should we be relying more on local sources? And I think this one's tricky um, because on the one hand, right, they're like, they might have interest to cover things that the Associated Press or whomever might not have interest to cover. So in that sense, it might help recover events. On the other hand, we do hear in a number of cases, um, you, it's, it's not as though these incentives to these editorial or capability biases go away. Um, so for instance, um, Syria seems to be a prime case of this where, you know, under the Assad regime, there was really no organic news media. There was the state kind of state run media. And so a lot of the individuals, as I understand it, that, that, that took on the role of reporting during the Syrian civil war were often activists. 
Um, they were individuals who wanted information to get out, but also who had a clear political agenda. And, and there are a number of like discussions around um, the activists themselves, either having, you know, from an editorial bias perspective, having incentives to only share particular types of information or from a capability bias, um, not being willing to share certain types of information because they were particularly vulnerable to retaliation by certain militant organizations. Um, so it, I, th I think that there are solutions there, but there's also like, it comes with its own sort of set of problems too. Absolutely. That, that does make sense. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. And, and I think, you know, and then of course, something else we could talk about is also kind of the, the ethical dimensions around, you know, encouraging different types of data that do maybe put data collectors in danger and et cetera, et cetera. Right. But that's, that's a whole different layer. That's a, that's <laughs> perhaps a, a question for, uh, for a, a future a future time when we have you on the OPSC. Um, so, uh, so barring any uh, additional questions, and again, thank you, Clara, for that that question. Very good. Um, I think we will wrap up there uh, unless there's any kind of final comments. Um, but I just want to thank everyone uh, in particular. Thank you, Andrew, for participating here and for bringing us a really fantastic paper. Um, I know it's made me think quite a bit about uh, the sources of data that I use, and hopefully it will encourage others to do the same. Um, Adine, thank you for fantastic comments and for also pushing us to think quite a bit about how we're using different forms of data. Um, so I will wrap it up there. So for those who were not able to uh, participate in the entirety of the session, um, this will be, again, available on the OPSC website. We also have a YouTube link, um, and you can go back and add comments on that YouTube that Andrew could see, or you are, of course, welcome to contact Andrew if you would like to provide additional uh, comments and questions on this paper. So uh, thank you all, and I hope you have a great rest of your Friday. And for those that are headed to Peace Science next week, uh, I hope you enjoy it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Y Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>